my greatest honor to welcome Father Peter, Father Paul, Father Anthony, Mr. McDermott, the faculty, parents, all those in attendance, and most especially, my fellow seniors, to the commencement ceremony for the class of 2022. My name is Samuel Minery, and I am sincerely grateful to be this year's Master of Ceremonies. This night marks the conclusion of an incredible journey that began eight years ago when our class was entrusted into the kind hands of Father Anthony Bitten. We knew him as our first form religion teacher, and he was one of the reasons students were excited to come into school. Since then, he has been a constant source of advice and counsel, and he has been our loving caretaker, despite numerous instances of shenanigans. In spite of, or maybe because of these, he has been our core master, and he has done a fantastic job shaping us into the fine young men who embody Cistercian's motto of our dare and the Now, please give him a warm welcome, or as he would say, welcome. <laughs> and please remain standing as he gives the invocation. Father, I ask you to pour your spirit down upon this group of people. We thank you for all of your blessings, especially the blessings of the class of 2022. I ask you to bless them today and in their future. Hear their prayers, forgive them their sins, grant them an increase in faith, hope, and love, and lead them one day, far, far, far in the future, into your everlasting home. We ask you to bless their parents, their family, faculty and staff at the Cistercian Prep School, and all of those gathered here today. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Now, I will begin introducing the valedictorian for today's evening. Old boy is what you would call the perfect honor student. He has a spotless academic record, he's a stalwart uh, tennis and football player, and he has been one of the most involved students in the Cistercian community. I had the opportunity to, uh, to know him more after working with him on student council, and I can see that he was the model class president. He was always on top of him, carrying his signature leather-bound journal at all times, and he was responsible for a seemingly impossible year of homecomings and proms for the first time since the pandemic. After working with him for a year, I think the skill that makes him so great as a class president is that he takes the time to look out for each person in this school, and his dedication makes him perfect for the job. As a student, he is often asked to be the grown-up in the room. He is a beacon of stability in the classroom, and he is often looked to by the teachers to get things back on track when things get a little bit rowdy, aka sometimes theology discussions, as we know. And as Father Anthony has sometimes reminded me, I don't have an excuse to show up late when he will show up at school at 7.45 to lead the Rosary Prayer Groups. And as well as this, he was one of the most outspoken members in our class Bible studies. He fully embodies what it means to be a student devoted to living a life of integrity and putting others before himself. His classmates certainly recognize it, as does everyone in this. Forward thinking and thoughtful, old boy. Well, thank you for that, Samuel. Um, before I begin, I would like to take time to express gratitude for all the people who made our time at Cistercian outstanding. Thank you to all of the monks, teachers, and coaches for waking up each day to form godly young men and for always being there to teach and guide. Thank you to Mr. Van, Mr. Shunk, and the rest of the maintenance staff for laboring to ensure that we students have a beautiful campus to work and play. Thank you to Nurse Nevin for the loving care and radiant joy in which you shine into the lives of every student and for bringing us donuts in our darkest days. Thank you to Officer Edwards for making and providing for a safe campus space. Thank you to Father Anthony for being like a father for eight years and forming relationships that will last a lifetime. And lastly, thank you to all of our parents and guardians for always being there for us, loving us unconditionally, and 
and making us the men that we are today. We are eternally grateful, and we love you more than you can know. I want to begin by telling a story about a young man who was deployed in the Pacific Theater during World War II. During the fighting, he and a few soldiers found themselves stuck underground in a tunnel and surrounded above by enemy troops. It was dark, cramped, and he was afraid. He and the other Americans silenced their breathing, but as their hearts were pounding and beads of sweat were forming on their faces, they heard a grenade clink down the tunnel and land right in front of their faces. It was a moment of excruciating fear, and as they saw their lives flash before their eyes, all they could do was wait in silence before a small, handheld explosive would soon decide their fate. Five, four, three, two, one. But nothing happened. The grenade didn't detonate. The company exhaled and said a prayer of thanksgiving, and the enemy soldiers eventually left from above ground, no longer suspecting Americans. The reason I tell this story today is because the young man in that cave some 80 odd years ago was my great grandfather. If that grenade had gone off, then my grandmother would not have been born, nor my father, nor me. I would not have existed. I remember listening to the story as a young boy and being fascinated by what I realized was the fragility of my own existence. However, thousands of generations, so many different events and factors had to go perfectly to result in my birth thousands of years later. It made me realize that I, just like everyone in this room, am a miracle. I tell this because this was the first time in my life where I realized how important it is to love life and live intentionally, and the responsibility that I have to build a life that I am happy with and one that I am proud of. I may not have fully understood it at the time. In this phrase, living intentionally, it's constantly taking on new meanings in my life, but I feel that this sentiment is of paramount importance as we move on into the next phase. For 18 years, we have had at least some part of our lives dictated to us. Factors such as where we were born, who our family is, or what school we go to, have been things that we had little to no control over. But that is all about to change. On this night of graduation, in which we say goodbye to the first chapter of our lives, and celebrate joyously as we cross into the next, we inherit the ability to write our own destiny, free from any concerns other than our own which is exactly why living intentionally becomes so important. No longer do you have people around you telling you what classes to take, what you should do, or who you should be. It's just you. You have the freedom to create your own destiny and write your future regardless of your past and become the person that you have always dreamed of becoming. Oftentimes, we are discouraged from thinking about ourselves because it's a little self-centered. But now is not that time. It's okay to be a little self-centered when you're creating your life, because it's your life. Every single night when you go to sleep, you are left with only your thoughts, and those are the ones that you need to be content with. And I'm here to tell you that, at least in my own experience, this happiness comes in realizing how much of a gift you are to the world, and figuring out what you can personally bring to it. Live intentionally and make a life that you are proud of, because you owe it to yourself and to the God who created you. Lastly. I implore you to never lose yourself in search of something else. Whether that thing be money, power, or love, you are too valuable to be anything other than yourselves. So often, it is easy to reduce ourselves to some trivial standard, and if we don't meet them, it is easy to lose sight of the individual beauty that is contained in each and every one of us. No matter how you feel now, or how you've been made to feel, let me remind you that you are immensely valuable, and you deserve to be around people that think the same thing. This is especially important as we begin searching for new friends in college, and eventually our spouses. There is a poem by Shel Silverstein that I read in kindergarten, and it came back to me as I was writing this speech. Its simplistic beauty and power still echoes through my mind. It goes like this. She had blue skin, and so did he. He kept it hid, and so did she. They searched for blue their whole life through, then passed right by, and never knew. When I look out on this group of guys this evening, I feel so honored to have been a part of your lives. What we have built together over our time here is extraordinary. It's going to be very tough knowing that there's not another school year next year where we can come back and see each other every day. Yet, at the same time, it's so beautiful to think that we sitting here today have 45 different dreams and imaginations ready to conquer the world and make it our own. Class of 2022, Take time to reflect over your first 18 years. 
because whether you like it or not, it will have a lasting impact on you. But use this reflection also as motivation to live intentionally and make a life that you are proud of. In this, you will uncover the true joy of being alive. So, class of 2022, on this evening when we are faced with the question of whether we are ready to start our own lives and bear all the beauty, joy, and pain that comes with it, let us greet it with a firm and resounding yes. Thank you. Our next valedictorian, Nathan Como, has been one of the smartest students in the class since he arrived in first form. He has been an integral part of the robotics club, and their recent successes over the past two years, including winning first place at the World Championships this year, wouldn't have been possible without his stellar work as the head of the business club. Not to use hyperbole, but Nathan has also been a part of every academic club you could possibly join. In the math club, he has been a serial winner on several first place teams since he joined the program in seventh grade. In Quiz Bowl, as I have been able to witness when I ever was on his team, he has an encyclopedic knowledge of literature, and he certainly knows how to get a high scoring game going. I've known Nathan longer than any of my classmates, actually. I met him in fourth grade, and I would not have heard about Cistercian if we hadn't met, and I'm certainly glad we did. He is one of the most fun people to be around in and out of class, either asking Father Lawrence the most tangential question possible in a finance class, or hosting a game of settlers at Catan in his own house. He knows how to be sincere, but he also knows how to not take things too seriously, both equally important skills. One of the most brilliant students in our class, Nathan. Members of the Cistercian Upper School, friends, family members, faculty and staff, Father Peter, Father Paul, Mr. McDermott, Father Anthony, and my dear classmates. I would first like to thank everyone who has gotten me here. Father Anthony, I am so grateful for your support and advice throughout high school. I'm sure that I speak for the whole class when I say that every time that I went into your office, whether of my own accord or not, <laughs> it was very obvious that everything that you said to me was unselfish and heartfelt. I knew that I could always trust your advice because you always call strikes as you see them. Mr. Sliga, I was frankly scared going into your class and sad to leave. Your essays were fun to write and they really helped me grow in my writing skills and in discovering myself. Father Mark, thank you for putting up with me over the past four years in robotics. Thank you for helping me grow in patience, foresight, and in not rushing into things. To all of the rest of my teachers, and to Mr. Blackwell, you definitely don't get thanked enough for what you do. So thank you for your patience, your kindness, your knowledge, your passion, and for guiding us through middle school and high school. And finally, to my parents and Marshall, I love you and I thank you, and I would not be here without your support. By starting the speech with gratitude, a scene from the recent Doctor Strange movie comes to mind. For those of you who haven't seen it, the movie is about traveling to different multiverses, which are parallel versions of our own universe. At the end of the movie, Dr. Strange asks his friend and fellow sorcerer, Wong, are you happy? With no response from Wong, Dr. Strange continues, you'd think that saving the world would get you there, but it doesn't. Wong replies, sometimes I do wonder about my other lives, yet I remain grateful in this one, even with its tribulations. Finally, Dr. Strange answers, I guess we don't have to go through it alone. There's a lot to unpack here. First and foremost, if you literally save the world and still don't feel happy, there's something wrong with you. 
On a more serious note, some things in life that you expect to bring you intense happiness fail to do so. For instance, I'm graduating high school right now. That's a pretty big accomplishment, yet I don't feel particularly joyful when I think about it. What brings me joy is thinking back on the experiences and the people who brought me to this day. If we go through all of life just focusing on reaching the next big goal, we will always be disappointed when we get there. We will also miss the chance to reflect and be grateful for that which has brought us here. Charlotte Bronte summed up gratitude perfectly when she said, Gratitude is a divine emotion. It fills the heart, but not to bursting. It warms it, but not to fever. The second part of the Doctor Strange quote is also important. Wong admits to thinking about what could have been in his life. This is a fully human and natural instinct. How Wong remains happy, though, is not by dwelling on these negative thoughts. Instead, he surpasses them by remaining grateful for the things that he does have. All too often in my life, and my classmates can attest to this, I find myself complaining. My freshman self once spent 15 minutes arguing over a quarter of a point for a grade. But this complaining keeps me from being happy. If we go through life with a negative attitude, always wondering about the different ways that our life could have gone, or about the different multiverses that exist, our could have, should haves, happiness will remain fleeting. For instance, in the movie, Wanda Maximoff relent relentlessly pursues a way to get to a universe where she has kids, since in her own universe, her husband died young. She turns bitter, and she is never satisfied. While in real life it's not possible to go to other universes, we all have parallel possibilities for the choices we make. If we aren't grateful for what we have, and if we are constantly thinking about the road not taken, we can easily turn to that same bitterness and anger. It sounds so simple, right? Just be grateful and happiness will follow. Yet, as my classmates can once again attest to, Rare are the Cistercian lunch table conversations that express gratitude compared to the ones that express frustration and complaining. So what is so hard about gratitude? For one, we feel a need to be in control of our own destiny. Expressing gratitude forces us to humbly admit the truth that our successes are in no way just due to our own amazingness. Second, Many people have a skewed understanding of what is fair. If you set unrealistic expectations of what is fair or average, you are bound to be disappointed. You also start to take more things for granted, things for which you should be grateful. The truth is that many people aren't as happy as they look to be. Social media, TV, and the internet in general are pretty deceiving. Finally, good occurrences while often more frequent than bad occurrences, are usually more under the radar. While negative occurrences in our life usually occur at the forefront of things. When your life is usually good, negative things that happen are very noticeable. As Professor Christian Thorogood from the University of Villanova said, we don't think to be grateful because we are often too preoccupied thinking about what has recently gone wrong. Complaining can become a habit, a crutch for explaining away our own fears of unmet expectations. Conversely, gratitude, like any other virtue, also requires cultivation. We have to practice it by taking a step out of our own egos, by not setting our expectations too high, and by not being overwhelmed by the frequency of negative things in life. When we are able to be truly grateful we bring happiness not only to our own lives, but to the lives of those who have helped us. The final part of the Doctor Strange quote, that we don't have to go through this quest for happiness alone, is perhaps the most important part. As a silly, uh, so, so, some things that bring happiness when shared with others bring little to no joy when experienced by oneself. 
has a silly but memorable example. During junior year, in the middle of a class, a pancake was being passed around. Not to be eaten, no one was particularly hungry, or at least no one wanted to ruin the fun. It was being passed around solely for the pleasure of giving it to the next person. Finally, one of my bright classmates had a great idea. He looked around, lowered his hands, and chucked the pancake at the ceiling. Thus began root cake. <laughs> Somehow, some way, it didn't fall back down. Not that day, nor the next. It was up there for three weeks. <laughs> my roommates and I can look back on that story and laugh, but only because we shared the experience together. It would not be nearly as funny if it had been one guy in his room throwing a pancake at the ceiling. <laughs> of course, this also applies to more serious things as well. Of all the things that members of the class of 2022 accomplished, from making it to the SBC football championship game, to qualifying for the mock trial state championship, to creating possibly the most stacked club soccer team ever, ND40, to winning the robotics world championship, many of the more impressive accomplishments were made enjoyable because they were done with friends. Like that pancake to the roof, we as a forum have stuck together to the good times and the bad. Let's not let that slip away as we move across Texas and the country. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, St. Paul wrote, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus for you. Likewise, Mother Teresa said, the best way to show my gratitude is to accept everything, even my problems, with joy. The church's teaching on gratitude is clear and bold. Having gratitude in all circumstances is certainly a difficult task, and it's not one that can be expected to come naturally. Complaining is a mindset, and so is gratitude. We can choose to practice either, but only gratitude will help us make sense of the challenges in our lives and only gratitude will make us truly happy. Again, I may not feel exuberant joy at this moment, but I do feel gratitude for all of my classmates and for the school, and that leads to contentment. Let us remember this emotion, and let us always remember that we don't go through anything alone. Thank you. Victorian, Christopher Harden is very, very good at things you would associate geniuses with doing. <laughs> I was privileged to take a Latin elective with Father Peter and Christopher during our sophomore year, and it is admirable, bordering on unnerving, to see a person who did not even take Latin in middle school read Caesar and Virgil for fun. I was in the class, and rest assured, I was not having a lot of fun. <laughs> Christopher joined our class in freshman year, and each year he has shown us more and more how extremely talented and virtuous he is. He has a seemingly photographic memory of the Bible, able to outquote monks here and there, and he excels at mathematics, being the captain or team member of numerous first place teams. Not to mention, he's a phenomenal tennis player as well. More than all of this, however, is that he will be happy to talk to anyone about his ideas. Especially in this senior year, he is engaging with his fellow classmate, offering advice and sharp insight. Classically trained and classically minded, Christopher Harden. occasion. Before I proceed, I would like to reiterate our thanks to the monks, Father Peter, Father Paul, to all the faculty, and to all the staff. Thank you all for your selfless service. In a special way, we thank Father Anthony, the time you have devoted to each one of us in prayer and conversation, 
or in another of the countless ways you serve us, demands our gratitude and our respect. You love each one of us and have sacrificed so much to enable us to be here tonight. Thank you. And to our parents, without whose love and support, we would be in a very different place. Thank you for your constant love and sacrifice. We love you so much. Tonight, I have some brief words for our form, and I include myself in these exhortations and hopes. We have been on a journey at Cistercian filled with both joy and adversity. But I hope that it has been a time of growth for us all. For me, this experience is a little bit like the scene from Dante's Purgatorio, where Statius explains the moment the soul is ready to move past the terraces of purgation and climb to the top of the mountain before entering paradise. Joyous, yet unexpected. For what seemed like so long, and most of you have been here four years longer than I have, we have been studying here, being strengthened by trial, and suddenly this moment has arrived where we are all ready to move on. But while it is fitting that we gather to celebrate our accomplishment, I ask, what have we truly achieved or completed in this time? Perhaps we think a lot, for we have made it through a rigorous formative education at Cistercian. Or perhaps we are inclined to say nothing at all. After all, we have not yet gone to college, let alone done anything in the real world, have we? It's after college that we must do this and that. Either of these thoughts might be tempting for you and me right now. My hope is that we strive to keep a proper perspective on life. Simply that our life's work is but a small part of something much greater, and that we strive not to live simply for ourselves, but rather to be motivated by charity towards others. Even the pagans possessed remarkable insight into this. Cicero writes that men are born for the sake of men, that they may be able mutually to help one another. In this direction, we ought to follow nature as our guide to contribute to the general good by an interchange of acts of kindness, by giving and receiving, and thus by our skill, our industry, and our talents to cement human society more closely together, man to man. Our formation at Cistercian has greatly equipped us for such a life. But what does this good life entail exactly? Do we tirelessly pursue excellence in everything that we do? Should it be our goal to change the everyday lives of people across the world, or to discover a new insight into how we understand the material universe? These may very well be good things, but even in seeking excellence, we can find ourselves in the dark wood with Dante. For if we pursue excellence privately for its own sake, what good is it when we are called to live lives of service to others? And we are constantly concerned with what we will achieve in the future. The focus has again become ourselves, and moreover, we will lead miserable lives of anxiety. There will always be a mountain to climb, a present challenge, an opportunity for growth for each one of us. We are faced with a choice. Either we can work for the common good, as Cicero calls us to, or we can seek principally our own gain like the avaricious in Dante's Purgatorio, with faces to the ground pray, at high seat pavimento anima mea, my soul bleeds to the dust. Let us multiply the talents that have been entrusted to us, and as faithful stewards, use them in service of others. Let us go forth and lead good lives for the sake of others. We must remember three words we all know so well, ardere et lucere to burn and to shine. St. Bernard said, only to be enkindled is vain, only to shine is little, to be enkindled and to shine is perfect. Yes, we ought to pursue excellence in all that we do. In our fallen state, mankind is inclined to take the easy route, to settle for mediocrity or to compromise morally. But since we are human, we are called to so much more than this, we are most human. We bear the image of God, our Creator, most fully. Not when we choose the wide gate or the easy way, but when we offer ourselves as living sacrifices. The 
the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. Unlike the lower creatures, we have the ability to give ourselves to the other. Our hearts must burn for the sake of others, and our shining must stem from this burning. Each must temper and direct the other. If we burn for ourselves alone, we do not multiply the talents entrusted to us. And if we shine not because of the burning within us, we shine only for our own glory. Earlier, I asked what we have finished or accomplished. The truth is that in this life, we are never finished growing, being purified, serving others. Until we draw our final breath, we must keep climbing the mountain. In this time, as we say our goodbyes and prepare to go our separate ways, we are filled with hopes and desires for the future. Lord willing, each of us has many years ahead of him. My hope is that we strive to live each day as best as we can, not obsessing over the past, nor worrying about the future, nor presuming to have another day. But rather, let us in the present moment do our utmost with what we have been given. For in the time that we say our final goodbyes on this earth, then what will we have accomplished? If we have lived for ourselves, this time will be deeply troubling. If, however, we follow a greater calling, if we offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, in this time, we will recognize the true completion of our life's work. Friends, much has been given to us, and therefore, much is expected of us. Each day, let us live accordingly. Let us keep climbing the mountain. commencement speaker, Mr. James McDermott. Raised in Dallas, Mr. McDermott graduated from Cistercian Preparatory School in 1991. He attended Davidson College in North Carolina, receiving his bachelor's in English with honors. From there, he spent five years with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, including two years in California working with the mentally ill homeless, and then he spent the next three years as an organizer in Houston. He attended law school at the University of Texas in Austin, graduating with honors in 2003. He moved to Del Rio on the Texas-Mexico border to work as a new rural public defender. In 2010, after managing offices and trying cases across rural South Texas, he moved to Big Bend country in far west Texas to create a new independent regional public defender's office. Mr. McDermott is an accomplished trial attorney Known for his innovative training techniques that often involve using skills and exercises from theater and acting in developing narratives in the courtroom. Additionally, he's a skilled appellate lawyer, a type of law that hones in on legal errors committed at the trial court level and seeks to overturn the trial court outcome. In fact, he achieved one of the rarest outcomes for a Texas criminal defense appellate lawyer, a unanimous decision for the defense from the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. Mr. McDermott has been a co-chair of the State Bar of Texas Committee on Pattern Jury Charges since 2021. He is currently a member of the Advisory Council of the Rural Justice Collaborative, a national group of innovative rural criminal justice experts working to identify best practices for rural committee to replicate. In 2019, he was honored by the State Bar of Texas with the Warren Burnett Award recognizing his efforts to improve indigent defense in rural Texas. He's clearly well accomplished since all of his titles are difficult to read. <laughs> since leaving Cistercian, Mr. McDermott has been an impressive servant to his fellow man. His tireless commitment to serving those in need of help by practicing law epitomizes everything Cistercian stands for. He has gone through the same Cistercian experience we did, probably with these same ferns, and, and I'm fully confident that he can teach all of us something tonight. 
It is my pleasure once again to introduce Mr. James. I spend my life with the despised and the damned, the poorest of the poor. I'm not in well-ordered halls or live on a landscape campus, but my days are spent in the darkest and messiest parts of people's lives. So what can I offer here? What can I offer? As you finish this part of your lives in this protected and beautiful space, I could talk about the school motto, we've heard it. It would be a safe and easy topic for somebody from the outside to come. Our dairy, our little cherry, a kindle and enlightenment. But as I read the sources and went to the roots, and I was returning to basic emotions of those words, burning and shining, setting on fire and burning brightly. All that thought of fire and burning made me a little nervous. I live out in Big Bend country, in far west Texas, in the dry Chihuahuan desert. That's fire country. There was, of course, a really famous fire in 2011 in Marfa, only 30 miles from where I live. The Rock House fire started from an electrical short in a house. The winds were blowing from the south at 60 miles an hour. The fire made it up to Fort Davis, 30 miles in 30 minutes, destroying everything in the way. It was so hot, so fast, it burned everything, even the cattle. There were not even bones left. Nothing to count, just ash and burned absence. That's fire. Just three weeks ago, fire on the edge of town in Alpine. Flames so hot, it looked like a cartoon. Tongs and ribbons of fire going up in the air, all consuming. It's all anybody could talk about the next day. At ball games, at the courthouse, in the grocery store, fire. With a sideways glance and a lowered voice to see who was around, we were lucky. There was no wind that day. If it had been blowing our way, we would all be dead. So I'm not going to talk about mottos about fire tonight. It's too dangerous. What I have to talk about really is myself. And the work that I do, some 30 years after my graduation from space, and I just realized last night, I was here 31 years ago on this stage. This exact same stage was followed with the same backdrop. <laughs> and the same firms. <laughs> I run a small public defender's office in five very rural counties. That means I have to often be really basic about this. I am a lawyer, and I represent poor people, only the poor. And I fight for them even when they accuse, and mostly when they're accused of some, of some really, really dark things. I represent murder cases. I represent child rapists. I represent abusers, drug traffickers. I represent people who are desperate and alone, abandoned. Sometimes they are angry or ill or hateful. Sometimes they're just sad. Most people would not describe my people as the deserving poor. No, my people, the people who I love, are the poor that no one wants. They are people who are in their darkest places, who remind us of our own darkness, the people that we are afraid of, and the people
people that we are afraid that we might be. Sometimes they are innocent, and I fight for them. Sometimes they are not, but there are explanations or reasons or problems to be solved. Sometimes mental illness has consumed them. Sometimes their darkness has just overtaken them, and that's all there is. The only thing that's left for them is darkness. And still I fight. There is a saying from the Desert Fathers and Mothers, those holy people in the third century who went to the desert of Egypt to be hermits. Abyxanthus said, a dog is better than I am, because it also has love, but does not pass judgment. I have that framed in my bedroom at home. It is the first thing I read when I wake in the morning. It's the last thing I see before I go to bed at night. It also has love, but it does not pass judgment. So that's what I try to do. I sit with my people where they are, exactly where they are, exactly who they are. Not to change them, not to fix them. I'm here to do the work that they need done. And maybe, maybe they will know sometime, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, they will know that they were not alone. Maybe they will remember in their darkest place that somebody was there with them. Why am I like this? What does this have to do with Cistercian? Father Chris was a very short man, almost no one like. He taught us moral theology in sixth form. He's dead now, 20 years more ago. He loved us very much. What did Father Chris teach us in moral theology? That is hard to say. Mostly, he wandered around the classroom talking about grace. He would pause here and there to tell us to cross out this paragraph in the book, to ignore that sentence. He would wander around the classroom telling us to tear out the pages. Tear them out, throw them on the floor. A snowstorm of moral theology on the floor of our classroom. He did give tests. On what? He would tell us the questions before me. He would write out the answers for us before we took the test. It is hard to cheat when the teacher gives you the questions and the answers. <laughs> so what did he teach us? He spent that year with us, 16-year-old boys talking about grace. How grace was all around us, waiting for us to see it, to smell it, to hold it, to catch hold like a spark of fire. Every way that grace was present in every breath, everywhere, always, we had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> I had no idea what he was talking about. Until, you heard in my intro, and I was with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps for a number of years. The Jesuit Volunteer Corps is kind of like AmeriCorps Vista, but it's sponsored by the Jesuits. You live in poor communities, you work in poor communities. You live on a small stipend. Back then, I think it was $50 a month. And one of those years, I was in Los Angeles, and I was working on Skid Row. 
And Skid Row in Los Angeles is very poor. It's the kind of place that you can smell the poverty. I was sent one day in June to go cover an office. There was a small satellite office from my agency that was up in Hollywood. Hollywood is also very poor. Covenant House is in Hollywood. It's homeless teens, teens that have run away and been kicked out. Desperate. It's not the movies. And to get from my house to Hollywood, to that office, I'd take two buses. I would go north on one bus, transfer, go west, actually, the bus system in Los Angeles is very good. And I got off on that bus to transfer, and right there was a donut shop. The bus wasn't there yet, and I had a couple dollars in my pocket, and said, man, I am a good person. I deserve a donut. <laughs> man. So I went in and got that donut, and I remember it was a raspberry jelly donut. Right? Dripping, right? <laughs> and I come out, and the bus is there, and I run to get on the bus. And if there's anything that Father Peter can tell you about me, is I'm a real follower. So I get on that bus, and you're not allowed to eat on this, and I want that donut. That donut stayed in the bag because I cannot eat it. So I don't eat it get to my stop and I get off and I'm walking down the block. I'm walking down the block. And somebody is walking toward me. A woman. Her clothes are not on right. And she's shuffling along. Her hair is big and dirty. There's some leaves. And you're too young to remember the 90s for the AIDS drugs and the way the AIDS destroyed people. And you're too young to remember heroin and what it did to people. But here she was coming up the street, dying. She was dying. Out of it, her body was failing. She was shuffling along. And then there was this man next to me, dressed nice, quiet. I did not see him coming. And he says to me, that's really sad. And I said, yes, it is sad. And I'm holding my donut. Yeah, I don't have donut. <laughs> he says, no. I said, I said, yeah. He says, no, that's sad. She, I bought her those shoes last week. <clears throat> and she can't even tie them to them. And he stood there and looked at her. And I stood there and looked at her. And my hands, it's June, and it's hot. Hands are getting sticky from that donut, and I can't move. And he walks past me, over to that one. And he gets down on his knees, and he ties her shoes. And you have read in your religion class the stories of the saints where they talked about this sun stopped in the sky. It was kind of like that. And you've heard about things like this, where it was as if all the air around them stopped and was on fire. And I couldn't breathe, and I couldn't move, and I was stuck in that sugar. I was stuck in that sugar. While the air was on fire around me, waiting. I can't tie my shoes to this day. If I tie them, they become untied. I stop and remember. That's right, you're looking. <laughs> it's a reminder that I missed something. That I was not ready for that thing that Father Chris was teaching. Father Chris tried to tell me how to be ready for God to come walking down the street, and I didn't know how to listen. Father Chris was telling me to see grace when grace reveals itself. Maybe next time I'll be ready. Until then, I sit with my people in their darkness, 
and together we wait. Grace is hard. Grace does things like that. It passes you by and leaves your shoes untied to remind you about what you missed. And the pain when you see that it is gone. There is a passage from one of the great plays of the 20th century. The question and answer should be in every catechism that speaks. It says so much what that pain was of missing God. In your experience of the world, how do people change? The answer, well, it has something to do with God, so it's not very nice. God splits the skin with a jagged thumbnail from throat to belly, and then plunges a huge, filthy hand in. He grabs hold of your bloody tubes, and they slip beyond his grasp, but he squeezes hard. He insists. He pulls and pulls until all your innards are yanked out. And the pain, you can't even talk about that. And then he stuffs them back, dirty, tangled, and torn. It's up to you to do the stitching. And they get up, walk around, just mangled guts pretending. Why? Why is grace that like that? So that when God comes walking down the street next time, smelling of sweat and urine and feces, when God comes walking half dead, you recognize what is going on. You aren't asleep. You know the fire for what it is, so that you can do what needs to be done. That's the thing about fire, says my friend Julie, who has watched her share of West Texas fires from her porch. Fire is dangerous and scary and painful and beautiful. A graduation speech is supposed to be linear and neat, easy to follow, a nicely packaged message, Half an hour ago, I promised Father Peter that was not what I was going to deliver. <laughs> I did not. I can't offer that. Not in my experience of the world. I only have death and grace, urine and God, fire and darkness, all mixed up in a dirty, smelly mess. Ardere et lucere, in the middle of all that mess, those words are a prayer to catch fire, to burn brightly, to change and be changed by an act of pure love. <laughs> to see grace in the darkest parts of life and to catch it and bring it into the darkness of others. So maybe, just maybe, they can catch it too. That is what you have learned here in Cistercian at this monastery school, why you come here instead of somewhere else. How to love, how to be loved, how to catch fire, and let fire change everything, because this school does not exist for itself. It is here so that you can take this fire to the darkest places, to the people who will never know Cistercian, who can never know Cistercian except for you. To take this fire to the unlovable and to tell them that you love them. Ardere et lucere. It is a prayer from ancient times from John the Baptist to St. Bernard to generations of Cistercian men and women for you. Catch fire. Burn. I could have skipped this whole speech and gone back just to the Desert Fathers and others. And that's where I'll end. Abba Lot went to Abba Joseph and said, 
Abba, as much as I am able, I practice a small rule, a little fasting, some prayer, meditation, and I remain quiet. And as much as possible, I keep my thoughts clean. What else should I do? Then the old man stood up and stretched out his hands towards the heavens, and his fingers became like ten torches of flame, and he said, If you wish, you can become all fire. Cistercians 53rd graduating class, for their sense of community, their close friendships, and their sincere readiness over the years to support each other in that diverse academic, athletic, and extracurricular accomplishments. Before distributing our diplomas, I would like to take a moment to share just some of their accomplishments. Over the last four years alone, and despite the pandemic, the class of 2022 has been very active in volunteering over 1,800 hours, though we as a school have no requirement for them to do so. These 45 young men have shared their energy, their time, and skills to help meet the needs of their neighbors and the larger community, including needs of the body, through paper for water, meals on wheels, hunger busters, feed my starving children, and part of blood care. Needs of the mind, the Cistercian's own tutoring club, and the Wendrin Study Center, and needs of the soul, to the main place in Irving, the Bella House, Bed Star, the Bridge, among many others. This class has also helped care for our environment, to keep Irving beautiful, and for love of the lake. Nineteen of the 45 members of the class have performed additional service to the local Young Men's Service League, with eight participating all four years of high school. One senior has been recognized with the Gold Presidential Service Award for serving over 250 hours this year alone as a supportive listener with the online service Seven Cups. Charles Reynolds, congratulations. Please come to the stage to receive your Gold Award. in the Boy Scouts of America, with 20% of the form, nine of its 45 members having successfully earned Scouting's highest award, the rank of Eagle Scout. Chris Abe, Ethan Christopher, Nathan Como, Julian DeLorme, John Ferretti, Andrew Murray, Dominic Pettisino, Connor Smith, and Noah Venter. Congratulations to our achievement. In athletics, 65% of the class played at least one varsity sport in high school. Under senior leadership, Cistercian has competed at a very high level. Among other accomplishments in baseball, basketball, cross country, golf, track and field, and tennis. In varsity football, they qualified for this year's SBC 3A championship game. In varsity soccer, they entered tournament play as the number three seed, losing only to the eventual conference champion, and in varsity swimming, they took third place in the winter of SBC, happily beating out a certain local rival school. 
Six of our seniors were recognized by the Southwest Preparatory Conference as all conference players. Three of these in multiple sports, including in football, Alex Artemani, Devin Comstock, and Eli Sanford. Cross country and basketball, Luke Rakowitz. In soccer, Jacob Quarles. In baseball, Alex Artemani and Eli Sanford. And in tennis, Misaki Prakaroli. Eleven seniors, the most in several years, also lettered in three varsity sports, thereby earning Cistercians Hall Award. Alex Artemani, football, basketball, baseball. Chris Ave, football, soccer, and baseball. John Ferretti, football, soccer, track. Misaki Fracaroli, football, soccer, and tennis. Andrew Murray, Chris Cross Country, basketball, and baseball. Landry Pingle, football, swimming, track. Luke Rain, cross country, soccer, and track. Connor Roy, football, soccer, track. Eli Sanford, football, basketball, and baseball. And Noah Better, cross country, basketball, and track. One senior, actually better than not three, but even four varsity sports his senior year. Cross country, basketball, baseball, and track. Very well done, and congratulations, Luke Rakowitz. <laughs> Cistercian's highest athletic award, the Hillary Award, is presented to the senior who has participated in multiple varsity sports at a high level, demonstrated sportsmanship, leadership, and character, in victory as well as in defeat, who has maintained a high level of academic achievement as well. This year's worthy honoree is Eli Sanford. <laughs> Looking ahead, we have one graduating senior who will go on to compete in athletics at the collegiate level playing baseball for Washington University, St. Louis. Congratulations, Alex Ardamani. Well done. <laughs> Turning now to mathematics. Would our senior mathletes please come to the stage as your name is called. In the Texas State Math League, the TXML, seniors Nathan Como, Christopher Harden, Joseph Hess, and Matthew Martin help lead our upper school math club to finish fourth place in the entire state of Texas. Well done. <laughs> and as if fourth was simply not good enough, in the Purple Comet Math Contest, participated in by several thousand high schools in over 40 countries across the globe, in the small high school category with up to 1,200 students, Cistercian's math team of seniors Nathan Como, Christopher Harden, Joseph Hess, and Matthew Martin, as well as junior Andrew Oliver and sophomore Brendan Herman, finished first in the state of Texas. Well done. <laughs> the American Mathematics Contest, the AMC, is designed to identify promising mathematical talent and to foster a love for mathematics. This year on the AMC 12A exam, senior Nathan Como placed third in school and Christopher Harden took second. On the AMC 12B, Nathan Como again placed third with Joseph Hess earning second. Further, because of their high scores, both Christopher Harden and Joseph Hess, along with two underclassmen, were invited to compete in the American Invitational Mathematics Examination, the AMI, this year. For perspective, only 82 of the very top high school math students in the whole nation qualify for this exam. A very high honor indeed. Congratulations to you and to all our math leagues. Well done. <laughs> The 
class of 2022 has also distinguished themselves in the arts. In theater, five seniors participated in Cistercian's innovative production of Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew, with Leo Ontiveros offering hilarious portrayal of Grumio, Noah Vedder serving as the romantic Lucencio, Nicholas Frano wonderfully portraying a wacky and a wild Vincencio, and kudos also going to seniors Julius Andrews for his incredible leadership of stage manager, and Juan Diaz for his technological support as project operator. Thank you all, and congratulations for a great production. <laughs> and Cistercian's Arts Board has grown considerably under this year's leadership of Nicholas Rano and Leo Ontiveros, along with the support of Julius Andrews, Juan Diaz, and Noah Vedder, successfully hosting two coffee houses, serving as ambassadors during Braveheart, and providing invaluable technical and production help for every theatrical endeavor, including the middle school show and the senior seminar as well. Thank you all for this time and this effort. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, in the arts, our seniors resume the wonderful tradition of constructing a metal sculpture at Braveheart to leave as a gift from the class. This year, seniors Colin Gildner, Cole Boy, Xavier Cowan, John Ferretti, Christopher Harden, Benjamin Linsenden, Charles Reynolds, and Eli Sanford, along with their foremaster, honed their creative energies to assist the lone dad, Mr. Mike Urick, in cutting and welding the scrap metal sculpture entitled The Visionary, which greeted you all as you entered our Tim Foyer this evening. Thank you all for this wonderful gift, this legacy. Cistercian's Literary Magazine Reflections is an impressive compilation of the creative endeavors of our students. Poetry, prose, sketches, artwork, and photography, all put together through the efforts of a select group of young men. These students mentor aspiring writers and artists and run competitions throughout the year, while continuing to work into the early weeks of the summer, post-graduation, when the halls are quiet here and the press is waiting. Today, we'd like to especially acknowledge the senior classmen who participated in the Reflections Elective. Xavier Cowan, Walker Homan, Ben Limsenden, Franco Miele, and Charles Reynolds. Well done. <laughs> We'd also like to honor three seniors who have gone above and beyond our greatest expectations asking them to please come to the stage to receive their award. Editors-in-Chief Walker Homan and Ben Nimsonben. <laughs> A special category was created this year for the third student who consistently and persistently submitted the most creative material over the course of his high school years. And that would be Leo Ontiveros. Well done. <laughs> in Cistercian's annual literary competition, the award for upper school nonfiction this year was earned by a graduating senior, whose winning piece in the tradition of Henry David Thoreau moved the judges to think deeply about the rhythms of life. One judge commented, it is a delightful contemplation of place in which the author with an earnestness of detail charms the reader into their own contemplations. For his narrative piece entitled, Eight Memories from Andrew Brown Park, would Joseph Hess please come to the stage receive your cash prize. In languages, the National Spanish Examination recognizes student achievement and proficiency in vocabulary, grammar, reading, and listening comprehension. Will the following students please come to the stage to receive your awards.
scoring at the bronze level and qualifying for the Premio de Bronze medal, Connor Roy. At the silver level, level, 85th through 94th percentile for the Premio de Plata medal, Masaki Fracaroli, Walker Holman, Landry Pingo, and Santiago Ramirez. <laughs> and scoring at or above the 95th percentile of all who took the exam earned the Premio de Oro Award. Cole Boyd and Jacob Foro. <laughs> and in French, in the National French Contest, Le Grand Concours, sponsored by the American Association of Teachers of French, over 42,000 students in all 50 states and abroad took a written test to demonstrate achievement and proficiency. Scoring in the 94th percentile to receive the silver award, Stefan de la Pena. <laughs> and with the most remarkable 99th percentile finish to win the gold award in French, Christopher Harden. As the culmination of the high school experience, our seniors recently presented their semester-long research on a wide variety of high-level topics to guests that included local university professors, other professionals, faculty, their peers, and their parents as well. No pressure. <laughs> topics included everything from the genetics of ADHD, to the evolutionary impact of viral phages, from a defense of modern monetary theory to social media's effect on the sports world, from an insightful study of existential philosophy to an examination of the prestige and intrigue of Renaissance Italy. And most notably, would you believe 25%, one quarter of the class made their presentations and took questions afterward exclusively in Spanish or in French. Very impressive. Congratulations to you all. Further this year, a unique offering was in the form of a drama, which seniors Nicholas Frano and Leo Antiveros wrote, directed, produced, and starred in their own one-act play. They did so with assistance from senior production team Julius Andrews, Noah Vetter, and Ritha Katapali, as well as classmates Peter Ellis and Juan Diaz, who made notable cameos as well. Congratulations to these seniors for their hard work with their senior seminar. For the second year, Cistercian's Mental Health Club helped to promote awareness about key aspects of mental well-being. Under the leadership of seniors Julian DeLorme and Samuel Minery, several presentations were hosted with a variety of speakers, including counselors, psychologists, and corporate executives that always sparked thoughtful reflection and discussion. Thank you, Julian and Sam, for your leadership and your vision for this extremely important work. Thank you both. Kudos to all our Model UN students who also did extremely well in the February tournament out of the Colony High School, with Walker Holman winning Best Delegate and Rithik Karapali being named the second most distinguished delegate. 
He also received the top award for best position paper. For the seniors, Ethan Beck, Julian DeLorme, Blake Harris, and Amara Baja have all been instrumental in laying a foundation for the future with this new Cistercian activity. Well done, and thank you. In mock trials, under the guidance of the seniors, Cistercian's small but mighty team progressed to the final round of regional competition and as a result of their overall rankings qualified to go on to state. At state, they finished just one point shy of fourth place and also claimed two of the top five individual awards in the entire state. Congratulations and thank you to our graduating seniors for their fifth place finish in state, Ethan Christopher, Rudy Gamboa, Samuel Menery, and Callum Woodhouse. We will definitely be there. Not to be outdone, and though only in its second year of existence, Cistercian's Finance Club entered the largest mock stock market competition in the country, named the Stock Market Game. Under the talented guidance of seniors Stefan de la Pena and Ethan Christopher, our five-member team of senior Amar Baja and sophomores Rithvik Gabri, Tom Gambo, Sam Rogers, and Ben Rafakis, they not only took first place in regional competition, but went on to finish third in the entire state of Texas. For this achievement, the team will be recognized at the National Stock Market Game Awards on May 18. A huge congratulations to these talented and savvy investors. Going beyond even the great state of Texas, Cistercian's yearbook, Exodus 2021, on our way, went national, earning the prestigious gold medal from the Columbia Scholastic Press Association with a score of 916 out of 1,000, among the very top in the country. The yearbook is also featured in Balfour's Publishing's annual national publication, Yearbook Yearbook, to showcase its exceptional work in theme development, in design, and in photography. The current yearbook, 2022, Reconnecting, under the steady leadership of Editors-in-Chief Luke Rain and Santiago Ramirez, Senior Editors Jacob Poros, Miguel La Raza, and Julian DeLorme, and the steady contributions of Chris Ave, has maintained the same commitment to excellence in publication. Thank you all for your commitment, your hard work, and your book. Amen. Speaking of national, Cistercian's Quiz Bowl team has distinguished itself again this year at multiple tournaments, finishing the top five at six different tournaments throughout the year, qualifying for the first time in recent years in three different teams for national competition later this month. Much of the success is due to the hard work and dedicated leadership of our veteran seniors, Nathan Como, Nicholas Frano, and Samuel Menery. Congratulations to you all and good luck at National. And as if Nationals were simply not big enough, you must have heard a moment ago, Cistercian's robotics team, Fusion Core 6672, not only qualified this year, which itself is quite a feat, but they went on to win first place in the world. Congratulations to all robotics team students, to the dedicated sponsor, to all the generous volunteer mentors and sponsors for an absolutely stunning achievement. This year's robot lived up to its name, Resilience, as did the team members themselves, who worked countless hours and creative over creatively overcame many setbacks to do so. Congratulations to all our graduating seniors for your leadership. Julius Andrews, Nathan Como, Xavier Cowan, Juan Diaz, Blake Harris, Rithvik Padapali, and Franco Mule. So well done. Well done. <laughs> Turning now to the results of this year's standardized exams based on their performance on the NMSQT exam. 11 seniors have all qualified this year as scholars 
of the National Hispanic Recognition Program. Congratulations, Stefan de la Pena, Julian DeLorme, Juan Diaz, Rudy Gamboa, Blake Harris, Christopher Harden, Mikel LaRaza, Leo Ontiveros, Jacob Foros, Luke Rain, and Noah Vetter. Well done. Further, 29% of this year's senior class, almost a third, are receiving national merit recognition, including 11 commended students and two finalists. For the following seniors, please stand to be recognized as commended students in the National Merit Scholarship Corporation. Alex Ardemani, Nathan Como, Rudy Gimboa, Walker Homan, Matthew Martin, Samuel Minnery, Franco Miele, Jacob Quarles, Connor Roy, Connor Smith, and Noah Vetter. Well done. And will now both Christopher Harden and Joseph Hess please come to the stage to receive your certificates as finalists in the National Merit Scholarship Corporation. Congratulations to you both. The final regular advanced placement test was administered just two days ago but this year's seniors have already earned significant distinctions for the test they have completed by the end of their junior year. For outstanding performance on three or more AP tests, the following four seniors have been recognized as AP scholars. Christopher Ave, Julian DeLorme, Preston Schnorbach, and Callum Woodhouse. For outstanding performance on at least four APs, we recognize as AP scholar with honor, Alex Artemani, Misaki Fraccaroli, Rudy Gamboa, Joseph Hess, and Noah Metter. And for outstanding performance on at least five exams, we recognize the following eight as AP scholars with distinction. Cole Boy, Ethan Christopher, Nathan Como, Stefan de la Pena, Christopher Harden, Walker Homan, Benjamin Limpsonman, and Jacob Oros. Congratulations to the hard work. At this time, would Lieutenant Colonel Michelle Meneer please come to the stage for the presentation of an Army ROTC scholarship. Lieutenant Colonel Meneer, in addition to being a current Cistercian mom, was herself once the recipient of an Army ROTC scholarship. Being with you today is a distinct pleasure. I'm here to present an Army ROTC scholarship to one of your classmates. Receiving this scholarship is the culmination of a rigorous and competitive selection process. Yes, this ROTC scholarship will provide full college tuition and mandatory educational fees for room and board, provide an allowance for textbooks, school supplies, and required equipment. More importantly, this recipient will have more to show for his college days than just a diploma. He will have the confidence, self-discipline, and leadership skills that come with having earned a commission as an Army officer. ROTC is a demanding and challenging complement to traditional college courses. The standards for admission into this program are quite high. They must be since the individuals who complete this training are ultimately entrusted with the lives of American soldiers. Please join me in congratulating Devin Comstock. Colonel Stephen Meneer, 
our United States Military Academy representative, Mrs. Sturgeon Dad, and yes, the husband of Lieutenant Colonel Manier, please come forward for the presentation of a Sturgeon West Point appointment. Good evening. My name is Colonel Steve Minier. I'm the liaison officer of the United States Military Academy of West Point, assigned to Sturgeon Preparatory School, and a West Point class of 1984 graduate. The mission of West Point is to educate, train, and inspire the Corps of Cadets so that each graduate is a commissioned leader of character committed to the values of duty, honor, country, and prepared for a career of professional excellence and service to the nation as an officer in the United States Army. One of your seniors, Julian DeLorme, is stepping up to accept challenges of West Point mission and a scholarship that includes all tuition, room, board, books, uniforms, medical and dental, and pay, and is valued at over $400,000. Each year, some 14,000 young men and women apply for admission to West Point. Less than 1,200 are accepted. Those who are accepted will spend the next four years at a beautiful, historic, demanding place that is unquestionably the world's premier leadership institution. A place with such famous leaders as Eisenhower, MacArthur, Grant, Lee, and Patton among the graduates of the Long Gray Line. In addition to leadership, West Point is also among the nation's top ac academic institutions annually being chosen as one of the top public universities in the nation. Upon graduation from West Point, Julian will become an officer in the U.S. Army. As an officer, he will be entrusted with the responsibility of leading our nation's sons and daughters around the world. In these times, it is important that we all recognize the magnitude of this responsibility, and Julian has proved that he has what it takes to succeed at West Point and in our Army. On behalf of the President of the United States, it gives me great pleasure to present Julian DeLorme with this certificate of appointment to the West Point Class of 2026. established two awards to commemorate his and his wife's mothers. He wanted the awards to go to the two most deserving seniors as determined by the faculty. At baccalaureate last night, Samuel Mennery in Humanities and Christopher Hardin in Math and Science were so recognized as these two most deserving seniors. Congratulations to you both. Each will receive a scholarship award of $2,500. Congratulations. <laughs> Samantha and Timothy Durst, parents of Jacob, class of 13, and Joseph, class of 15, established an award named after Abbott and Zalmanage, the tenacious and noble founding superior of Cistercian Abbey, Our Lady of Dallas. Selected the community's first superior, Father Anselm negotiated tirelessly against significant opposition to acquire the land, the funding, and the authorizations necessary to found the Cistercian community, to start the Cistercian Preparatory School, and to raise the monastery to the rank of Abbey. The Abbot Anselm Naj Award recognizes the one senior whose integrity, care for the greater good, cheerfulness, kindness, diligence, and tenacity have been distinguishing characteristics in his own efforts to meet the rigorous demands of the academics of Cistercian. This award recipient is also someone who has been a source of encouragement and support for his classmates. The baccalaureate last night, this award, 
and a $2,000 scholarship was bestowed upon a very deserving senior, Landry Pingo. Congratulations. The Lance K. and Judith W. Murray Award was established by Todd Murray, father of Andrew Murray of this class of 2022, and by Judith Murray, Andrew's grandmother, in honor of Andrew's grandfather, Lance Murray, who suffered from right side heart failure and endured years of medical treatment and multiple surgeries. In response to his condition and the care he received at hospitals and medical offices, the Murrays funded this award to encourage one of Cistercian's bright students interested in the biological and medical sciences to follow their passions to make a difference for other families going through difficult health situations. Last night at Baccalaureate, the award in the $2,000 scholarship was presented to senior Noah Vetter. Congratulations, Noah. Thank you, Todd and Judith, for honoring Lance in this most moving and beneficial way. Thank you very, very much. Todd and Judith. <laughs> the Cum Laude Society recognizes each year those students who have the best cumulative averages and earn at least their third year at Cistercian. The first 10% were inducted at the end of their junior year. They were cold boy. Nathaniel Como, Christopher Harden, and Noah Vetter. The second 10% are being inducted tonight. As I call your name, please come to the stage. Chris, Chris, Christopher Ave, Walker Homan, Samuel Minery, Jacob Orles, and Luke Christopher Rakowitz. Congratulations. Headmaster's Honor Roll. At the end of their senior year, nine students have earned straight A's. Julius Andrews, Cole Boy, Ethan Christopher, Nathan Como, Stefan de la Pena, Rudy Gamboa, Christopher Harden, Joseph Hess, and Samuel Henry. Very well done. achievement with interest and participation. In theology, Ethan Christopher. In English, American government and economics, Christopher Harden. Linear algebra, Julius Andrews. Financial calculus, Samuel Memory. STEM calculus and biology two, Joseph Hess. Chemistry two, Eli Sanford. And physics two, Connor Smith. Well done.
this time, I ask Father Evan Peter and our other distinguished guests to please come forward for the distribution of our diplomas. Julius, Gilbert, Lloyd, Tran, Andrews. <laughs> Alex, Parker, Artemani. Christopher Paul Ave. <laughs> Ethan River Beck. <laughs> Colin Bishop Bildner. Edward Christopher. <laughs> Nathaniel William Como. <laughs> Devin Andrew Comstock. John Xavier Francis Howen. <laughs> Oliver Graham Curlin. Stefan de la Pena. <laughs> Julian Pierre Marie Delorme. Peter Augustine Ellis. <laughs> Joseph John Ferretti, Jr. Masaki Marcello Fraccaroli. <laughs> Nicholas Andrew Frano. Rudolfo David Gamboa. Christopher Ryan Harden.
Blake Cody Harris.
Tristan James Schnorbach. to the end of these commencement ceremonies, we send the class of 2022 on its way. May they continue along the path, using their minds and their hearts in ways that glorify you and that serve their neighbors. Let this alma mater that is Cistercian strengthen them when the path ahead turns uphill. Guide them when they reach a fork in the road and lift them up when they stumble. May they always safeguard the flame of love you have placed in their hearts. May they bring the light of truth and love into our world. With gratitude for your countless gifts to each of us, and most especially to the class of 2022, we ask you now to bless these young men, protect them and fill them with the desire always to seek you through your Son, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. May Almighty God bless each one of us, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I present to you the class of 2022. East Gymnasium just across the lobby. As you exit through the doors on my left, please do not stop in the door or remain in the foyer. We go all the way through the gymnasiums. The graduates will be there shortly. God bless you and have a good evening.